thank the Director General, uh, Mr. Iwamoto, and uh, Ms. Uh, Yokonojima and Ms. Mieko Okura for uh, inviting me to give this talk and for facilitating it. So thank you very much indeed. I'll just... So I hope that gives you a full screen of my presentation. I'm speaking to you from the uh, unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people in Australia. Um, and I acknowledge their elders and their uh, communities past, present and emerging. So my talk today is on intangible cultural heritage or ICH in a climate of emergency. And it's really about understanding some of the possible roles for intangible cultural heritage in this context of an ongoing climate emergency. So the intersection of climate change and ICH is a topic that's of very real interest and of immediate relevance to all of our lives. Both of these concepts, climate change and ICH, have quite deep histories as ideas but they've only achieved recognition in their current form and in those terms very recently. So one of the challenges for us is to bring them into productive conversation with each other. And it's still quite a new conversation. So what I have to say today is in many respects exploratory. I'm not defining a, um, or speaking to a very well-defined field. Uh, and we are, all of us, learning about how to have this conversation between two very different fields. There has been recently a dramatic increase in attention to climate change in cultural heritage policy, and on the other side, a growing awareness of the importance of culture and cultural heritage in thinking about climate change and climate change adaptation. And uh, as the introduction uh, said, part of uh, this is, forms part of ongoing work for UNESCO's living heritage entity, which includes a major review of what we think may be the relevant literature. But what I have to say doesn't represent UNESCO at all or its position on the topic. And I should indicate too that the images that I'm going to show on the side of each slide don't necessarily relate directly to the content of the slide, but they're a sort of visual register of some of the important sources in this field that people may want to consult. So just as a synopsis of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to look first of all at the two, the two fields that we're bringing into conversation, ICH first, and then climate change and climate change adaptation, and then look at the ways in which they feature in each other's policies. Where is ICH in climate change and disaster risk reduction policy? And where is climate change in heritage policy? And briefly, some of the other frameworks outside of those two fields that do some of that work on bringing ICH and climate change into conversation with each other. And then I'll conclude briefly by looking at some of the roles for ICH, so the positive or mitigating uh, potential of ICH in a climate change context, some of the risks for ICH, the ways in which it might be impacted by climate change, and then briefly some of the challenges that we're going to confront in the very near future in thinking about how best to safeguard ICH in the context of climate change. So ICH, of course, has its origins in the 2003 convention, but it's very clear and particularly clear when you do a major global literature survey that there's very little familiarity with the term ICH beyond heritage scholars and professionals. It's certainly not part of public discourse. You don't hear people talking about ICH on the subway at the end of the day. The precise term comes into circulation only after the 2001 International Roundtable on Working Definitions and then the establishment of the Convention in 2003. So you will not find the term intangible cultural heritage in any substantial uh, way before about 2003. And yet obviously there's a lot of work that is of relevance to us and that we could very usefully use. Some of the concepts and terms that are in much wider circulation than ICH include, and I list them all there, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, indigenous technical knowledge, traditional knowledge, traditional ecolo ecological knowledge, urban knowledge, vernacular knowledge, and so on. And it's very important that we recognize and acknowledge 
that these terms are not synonyms. They don't work exactly as translations or substitutes for ICH. They all have their own histories of development, their own communities of use and practice, um, their own definitions. And we need to find ways in which to bring them into conversation and into relationship with ICH. It's important too that we recognize that they're not easily demarcated or distinguished from each other. There aren't neat boundaries between things like traditional and indigenous forms of knowledge. And I think that is because the development of each of these terms or categories has not been in relation to each other. We didn't develop the idea of traditional knowledge in opposition to or in relation to indigenous knowledge. All of these terms developed, developed in opposition to a very different form of knowledge, often referred to as technical or state, scientific or academic or scholarly, or even Western knowledge. And of course, all these terms are open to contestation. And it might sound like I'm being very academic, even thinking about these terms, but they really do matter. Um, when we're entering into a field where convincing colleagues of the importance of ICH is about the visibility of the term and the visibility of the concept and its transparency for people, okay? How easy it is to understand. What is interesting about knowledge in all of these systems it is, is that it is very much living. It is not frozen in the past. So it's dynamic rather than static. And each of these knowledge systems has a very specific history of development. It's important too that we recognize that it's not, this kind of knowledge is not evenly distributed within communities. It varies with age, with gender, with social status, with cultural category. And it is always what we might say interested. It is always part of a political process, part of an agenda or the way in which it is used is politically motivated as well. But it's also important to recognize that these forms of knowledge, uh, let's call them living her heritage for the moment, are not undermined or made irrelevant by the fact that we are now in a, uh, a global uh, uh, context of climate change, because they are all living, they are all dynamic, and they are capable of considerable flexibility and adaptive capacity in the future. And this is where they become relevant for us in thinking about climate change. Of course, ICH also refers to more than just knowledge. It includes performance, practices, the integration of the tangible and intangible worlds and different forms of heritage. So I think we need to retain the breadth of the concept of ICH, maybe with reference to the new term, the new preferred term, which is living heritage, but remaining open to the potential and the possibilities that are, that are invoked by each of these other terms in use. And crucially, I think we need to really reflect on ICH in its dynamic mode. We talk about this a lot. We don't explore it very much. And so models of ICH transmission in particular are essential if we're going to develop appropriate safeguarding strategies. You can't safeguard something until you have a model of how it is vulnerable. And to have that model of vulnerability, you need to understand the ways in which it is transmitted and the ways in which it is made vulnerable. Uh, and if we have time, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the people, place and story framework that seeks to do some of this work, or at least act to help us to do that work. So if we turn to climate change, I'm not going to spend much time defining this, but I do want to note that, of course, again, it is a relatively recent concept. It's only been in circulation since about 1979, and it really only took off in public consciousness from about 2007. So, and there's obviously an ongoing debate about when climate change or anthropogenic climate change, the climate change uh, that is in part caused by human activity uh, was initiated. Was it in the Neolithic? Was it in the, during the industrial revolution or was it in the 1950s? But what we do know is that we can find effects very similar to those of climate change in earlier literatures on environmental change, on natural hazard disasters, and so on. And all of that becomes relevant to us as we think about strategies for safeguarding in the future. The other thing about climate change is, of course, it is a complex problem, perhaps the most complex of problems facing us. And like all complex problems, there is no single knowledge system, no single academic discipline that is going to understand, help us to understand that, 
or resolve it as a problem. It's going to involve the integration of multiple perspectives, including ICH. There's increasing interest in the idea of plural knowledge systems, the ways in which different knowledge systems are brought together to tackle complex problems, whether it's climate change or not. And these metaphors of braiding or weaving of different knowledge systems are becoming quite popular. Um, but it's important to recognize that this is a collaboration between different systems, such as scientific and indigenous knowledge. It's not about their incorporation or assimilation or integration under a single dominant system. Very important that they retain their autonomy as different knowledge systems. So perhaps the two most important points that I want to make today um, are points from the perspective of living heritage. The first is that climate change is always experienced locally. So we might have a theoretical grasp of climate change as a, as a global phenomenon, as something that impacts on everyone in the world, but our individual direct experience of it is going to be practical and local. And the nature of the climate change at that location will vary from other locations, of course. And the second point is that climate change is most commonly experienced as natural hazard disasters, as floods, as cyclones, as drought. And it's these disaster experiences that inform our strategies for coping with climate change at the local level. And this is where ICH has a really powerful contribution to make. So because living her heritage is related to particular local communities and particular local environments, and the mitigation of the natural hazards at those locations, it is perhaps the most significant resource for mapping climate change adaptation strategies, both in the past and imagining them in the future. So in the context of living heritage, this local experience and this local knowledge of disasters, whether these are climate related disasters or seismic such as earthquakes and tsunamis, or even anthropogenic disasters such as nuclear plant meltdowns, the way in which we deal with those and the vast literatures that we have already available to us on these topics are of absolute and direct relevance to the challenges of climate change adaptation. So let's look now at the way in which ICH and climate change feature in each other's policies. And I'm not going to look at, uh, describe any of these in any great detail. The impression that I'm trying to give to you today is simply that we have a very complex but very full architecture in place on both sides of this conversation. There's nothing wrong with the sheer number of initiatives and institutions and policy structures that are already in place. But it is important to notice that on both sides, at the inception of the policy process, there was almost total ignorance of the other field so that there was almost no reference to culture or to cultural heritage in any of the policy or the literature on climate change or on disaster risk reduction before about 2010. And you can map this process by looking at the IPCC assessment reports starting in 1990 and coming right through to uh, 2022 and 2023. So the assessment reports from AR1 through to AR4 have virtually no reference to culture at all, and certainly not to heritage. Really only in AR5 in 2013-14 do we start to see that reference. And of course, there's much more in the most recent um, assessment report six. There are a host of initiatives that seek to do some of this work of integrating local communities and indigenous peoples into conversations about climate change. And I just list some of them there. I'm not going to discuss them in any detail, but I do note that uh, most of these date back to about 2006, 2007, coming through to the present. And there's a rapid increase in the development or proliferation of these various platforms or policies. Of course, the COP26 draft decision emphasizes the important role of indigenous peoples and local communities, culture and knowledge in effective action on climate change. So we're having major statements come out of uh, fora like uh, COP26 that reinforce the importance of this relationship. That said, when you um, look at ground level, 
things are operating much more slowly. And if you look at the post-disaster needs assessment framework, the PDNA framework, which is introduced to um, assess impacts in the immediate aftermath of a major uh, natural hazard disaster, um, you'll see that culture was only introduced as a kind of a separate category in 2013. But ICH specifically is almost never addressed in PDNAs. And that is a challenge for us collectively. It's usually because there are no baseline, comprehensive baseline infantries for people to work with in a very short time frame. But it's also because I, thought, I think we lack a theory of vulnerability for ICH, a theory of impact. There's no easy way for us to think about how ICH is impacted by disasters or by climate change. We don't have those theories yet. On the flip side, let's look now at how climate change has featured in heritage policy. And I think it's fair to say that um, although climate change began as a conversation in the 1970s when the World Heritage Convention was, was established, it doesn't feature at all either in the World Heritage or ICH conventions, very little indeed. Um, and that change began to happen again in about 2006, so quite similar to the conversations being held on the climate change policy side. Um, and UNESCO has taken a global lead in promoting this conversation between cultural heritage and climate change. So at a UNESCO level, and I'm not going to go through all of those programs, but you can see uh, both the, the period in which they've unfolded, um, uh, starting back in 2002, but really taking off in the 2010s uh, and through to the present. Moving down to the individual conventions, the World Heritage Convention took an early lead in this from about 2006, uh, recognizing the uh, direct impact, likely impact of climate change on tangible or world heritage. Um, and a whole series of policy documents have uh, emerged from the conversation through the World Heritage Convention. The 2003 convention has similarly um, begun to really address both emergencies and climate change, particularly from about 2016. And you can track these discussions uh, and the establishment of the operational principles and modalities for safeguarding ICH and emergencies in 2019. ICOMOS has also been involved, uh, the future of our pasts. Um, our report in 2019 is, is an important and very useful document. But perhaps the most interesting conversation has been this one that has unfolded over the last two years, an international co-sponsored meeting on culture, heritage, and climate change. So involving ICOMOS, IPCC, and UNESCO. And that generated three white papers. The first of those white papers directly um, uh, interests us, and that is the paper on intangible cultural heritage, diverse knowledge systems, and climate change. Very important report, it's available on the web. That's the image of the cover on the, the left-hand side. Then there are some other frameworks that stand outside the conventional climate change and heritage fields, but that direct our attention to the relationship between ICH and climate change. And these I think are really important to take note of. There are a series of development-based frameworks. So UNESCO has had input into the thematic indicators for culture for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the SDGs. FAO has developed technologies and practices for small agricultural producers. Then there are a series of biodiversity-based frameworks, very important and quite early initiatives uh, through IPBBS, uh, CBD, uh, and then this International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity. So there's a, a, an entire field there that we really need to understand and bring into this broader conversation. There are also rights-based frameworks. So the UNHR, UNHR Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights produces an annual report or has since 2020, and also country visit reports that very directly considers um, ICH within cultural heritage and cultural rights. So a rights perspective on the relationship between climate change and ICH. And lastly, there are any number of independent national initiatives, and I single out just one of them here, which is the framework for the National Climate Change Risk Assessment for Aotearoa New Zealand, which positions very centrally Indigenous Maori ICH and knowledge um, as, as the centerpiece of its response uh, to climate change. So a really um, kind of breakthrough document at a national level. But there are many others from many other countries as well. So what are the possible roles for 
ICH in mitigating the impacts of climate change. There's a very well-established dual role model for ICH in emergencies, and it applies to climate change as well, which argues that ICH has a role in diminishing or mitigating the impacts of climate change, but that it's also at risk from climate change. So a positive and a negative, and I think of them as positive roles and negative risks. There are thousands of case studies available globally, and I'm sorry that I'm not discussing any case studies today. It's very abstract, very dry, but I simply don't have time to engage in case studies. I have one up my sleeve if we have time that I can discuss. Um, but these case studies cover every environment and they describe the way that ICH is used to monitor, to limit or to mitigate the effects of climate change and climate related disasters. And they can be drawn upon to model possible strategies for climate change adaptation. Viewed globally, ICH is an exceptional source of ideas about preparedness, about how people have adapted over the long term to local environments and change and risk. It's a source of resilience, understanding how flexible responses to risk might be the basis for climate change adaptation in the future. They are also an inspiration for collaboration. These are knowledge systems capable of informing or working with or alongside other knowledge systems such as uh, science on an equal basis. And they're also very much a model for community-based agency. And this is where the 2003 convention's uh, emphasis on community-based decision-making in, in the ICH uh, framework is a really important lead. We've seen community-based disaster risk reduction being developed through particularly the Sendai framework. And I think we have there a basis for community-based climate change adaptation as a framework for thinking about climate change adaptation. Of course, there are risks too. And I think most of uh, the, the appropriate models that we can draw on for assessing risk to ICH from climate change come from models developed for disaster risk reduction research and policy. It's interesting that disasters and climate change are not inevitably negative for ICH. And I think um, Takakura Sensei has written on this as well about some of the remarkably positive effects that disasters can have for ICH specifically. Um, they can stimulate uh, conversation around ICH transmission, draw attention to the need for safeguarding. So it's not an automatic equation between disaster and loss for ICH. But if we're going to model ICH risk, <clears throat> climate change risk, we really need a lot of further research. We need to understand how ICH transmission is vulnerable in general, whether it's loss of access to materials or uh, locations that are necessary for the performance and the reproduction of ICH. Then we need to look at how ICH is vulnerable to climate change very specifically. And finally, we need to think about the safeguarding measures that are appropriate and that directly address those particular vulnerabilities. It's a big process to go through and we don't really, we haven't really begun it yet, I don't think, in a systematic way. The other thing that emerges from this kind of global survey of the literature is that relocation is perhaps the single most critical threat for ICH transmission. It usually means loss of access to other members of the community, to landscapes, to materials, raw materials and resources, to ancestors, and ICH in new resettlement location is also under threat itself. So I think we're going to have to think about relocation and ICH um, as a particular area of, of focus and concern. Let me close then um, by just thinking about some of the challenges that we face collectively in bringing these two fields into conversation with each other. I think there's a general consensus, and I've tried to give that impression by filling up my slides with lots of examples of uh, institutions and policies, that a lot of the necessary policy architecture for an effective integration of ICH and, C and CCA is already in place. We don't need a proliferation of further architecture. But the research base, the political will at the level of states parties, and the required funding commitments 
are all currently insufficient for the challenges that confront us. In no particular order, and only as, as a way of opening the conversation around challenges, I would identify this problem that we have with terminology. How do we sell the importance of ICH when most people in the world have no idea what it means? How do we appeal to vocabularies that are in place, ways that people talk about local knowledge, which they perform and practice on a daily basis, so that people can recognize what we're talking about? We have to think seriously about the conversation that needs to be had about reintegrating tangible and intangible forms of heritage and recognizing how they support each other and neither operates in the absence of the other, okay? And, and this is an area where perhaps the distinction between the World Heritage and ICH conventions has not served us well in creating discrete conversations or discrete communities of practice. We do need to do this work of mapping, understanding ICH vulnerability and then mapping it through the disaster cycle, if you like, or over the long term, something like adaptation biographies. How does ICH change? How does it become vulnerable over the long term? We don't have many good studies of this. We have studies in response to a particular event. We don't have follow-up studies 50 years later that say, well, what actually happened to the ICH 50 years after that event? I think we need to cast a very broad net to be open to the possibility of finding adaptation strategies all over the place. If we have too narrow a focus on particular forms of ICH, or if we look at climate change too narrowly rather than adaptation strategies more broadly, we risk missing out on crucial insights. And I'm also struck by the scope for not necessarily a global plan, but a more organic development at a regional or thematic level of networks of practice. So areas like the Caribbean or small island developing states that are confronted by broadly similar challenges and have broadly similar experiences. And this is, of course, a, an exploration that is um, already underway uh, through the 2003 convention. What is absolutely certain is that ICH or living heritage is going to play an increasingly central role in the way that we address and adapt to a changing climate. But we need to bring these two into that con into conversation with each other, living heritage and climate change, and to do so as quickly as possible and as robustly as possible. And I'd like just to close by just observing that IRCI's commitment to work on ICH and emergencies in Asia and the Pacific feeds absolutely directly into this conversation. It is one of the resources that are going to be essential uh, moving forward into the future. Thank you very much indeed. I thank you, uh, Baraz Hase. I, I really enjoyed uh, your talk and it is very, very informative and very well balanced, the description about the, uh, the issue the ICH and the climate emergency, or exactly say a uh, climate of emergency. Um, I, you know, uh, you know, I learned lots of things and uh, from your presentation. And uh, I basically, I, you know, agree with your, your <clears throat> um, argument. And ICH, in particular, the climate change is a very important issue. And it is not only this uh, this this argument is not only by you but also many international uh, organization and already established uh, agreement differs is the importance of the ICH in in the situation and I also learned from the you know uh, uh, climate change uh, I how should I say um I I have never have a thought about the uh the necessity of the conversation between the climate change and the ICH uh so but I, I from your presentation you know that conversation should be more explored more deepening that is uh, my uh understanding from your presentation and uh, what I want to say is uh, uh, uh what should I say? Um, the one thing is, uh, uh, why do you uh, think or do you uh, argue the 
the the conversation necessity of the conversation of the, between the two, because the uh, from your presentation the climate emergency is a, something similar to the disaster, and most of the argument is somehow you know an overlap with the ICH in the disaster natural hazard. So my question is, you know, uh, why do you, you want to expand uh, this ICH role? To the climate change. Of course, I, I roughly understand, but I would like to, you know, more specifically answer your question, uh, your your argument. I want to hear your argument. And second is the, um, uh, I, I suppose this is uh, my uh, com uh, uh, comments, rather than question. And from my experience in 2011 Japan earthquake. Uh, in particular, local context of the uh, uh, ICH. Thank you for your mention about my work. Uh, but from my experience, not uh, not only the ICH, but also the so-called heritage. I mean, tangible heritage like uh, historical documents or some uh, some some heritage. Also have a special role something similar to the ICH, because the local community try to use these cultural value to, to recover the local community or local community building. So, um, uh, uh, so it's, uh, it seems to me, it, it, maybe this is a not a question, uh, not only to you, but also to me, but, you know, if we consider the, the role of ICH, Again, it's the climate emergency or natural hazard. Should we, you know, limit only for the ICH, but also the tangible heritage? And uh, the last question, last uh, question is there. Uh, okay, what I want to say is there. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is also rather than uh, question comments. And I totally agree with the importance of the ICH. And from the, my experience, maybe also you may uh, have a similar experience. Uh, there, the people, policy makers and many people don't understand the importance of the ICH, in particular for the uh, disaster, the, the, the disaster reduction uh, uh, the the DRI, and for example, there's uh, as one one document you mentioned, the Sendai framework. As far as I know, the Sendai framework really could describe the role of local communities, indigenous knowledge, but uh, most of the policy maker, for example, Japan or my university, you know, does not regard this aspect. They only think about the more infra infrastructure. Or medical stuff. So, you know, how do you think the change of this kind of a, you know, current situation of ICH in the more broadened uh, field of the climate change and the natural hazard disaster uh, mitigation? Um, uh, we we know probably because we heritage not heritage scholar, so we believe or we know how the cultural heritage, intangible cultural heritage have a powerful tool for the mitigation or preparedness or uh, against, the, uh, against the vulnerability. But uh, yeah, you know, yes, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted to persuade some engineers, some politicians. So I would like to uh, listen your, your way to break it through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Takakura Sensei. Um, I might need another half hour to respond to all of those questions, but let me try to respond to them briefly. Um, so the first question about why the need for a conversation between ICH and, and climate change. First of all, because climate change should not remain in the hands of state level bodies mm -hmm. or global international bodies. Uh, nor in the hands of scientists alone. It's something in which we all have an extraordinary vested interest. And 
because as i said uh climate change will be experienced by all of us locally mm -hmm. the way in which we respond to that is not going to depend upon scientific uh, decisions or even state level policies it's yeah. going to be about strategies developed locally and often even autonomously from the state or from science how do we understand what those processes are and and that's not even saying that that's the best way to respond it's the reality of how people will respond if you're living in central africa mm -hmm. you are not going to be assisted by your state or by global science in responding to climate change you are going to have local strategies mm -hmm. So how do we understand what people are actually doing? There's another reason for having that conversation, and that's because I don't think there's enough of a conversation either between climate change science and disaster risk reduction. For the strangest of reasons, they seem like two ships passing in the night. They don't talk to each other. Yeah. But actually, the fact that both depend upon uh, local knowledge um, and living heritage, in fact, I would argue, means that they can be brought into conversation with each other as well so it's a three-way conversation between living heritage climate change and drr and i think that's a really necessary conversation mm -hmm. um you talk about the particular you know the challenge that you've experienced after the Tohoku uh, disaster in 2011 um and trying to convince people that ich is important in this context um i it's, it, it, this is always a problem. Um, people will always focus on things that can be measured and photographed and immediately monetized. They can have a monetary value attached to them and a, uh, the cost of reconstructing a temple or whatever. But the way that I explain it to people is that without the local knowledge, it's all just a large archeological site. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, the meaning of all of that material culture mm -hmm. depends upon local knowledge. And it's almost as though we take the local knowledge for granted. It's like a free attachment to the building, but it's not the case. Mm -hmm. And our knowledge of the meaning of these buildings can fall into disuse if it's not also safeguarded and attended to. Um, and so if you want to deal with an entire landscape as, a, as an archeological site, <laughs> then, then go ahead. But we know that archeologists struggle to attach meaning to their finds. And that's not the way that we should manage things. Um, and lastly, your uh, question about, again, uh, trying to um, interest policymakers in the importance of ICH. We do struggle to do that. And I think a large part of the reason is because we struggle to explain to ourselves how ICH has a role to play and how ICH can be impacted by disasters or climate change. We don't have very good models ourselves. We have safeguarding strategies that are particular to particular elements of ICH, but in terms of an overall theory of ICH transmission and ICH vulnerability, I think we've got a long way to go to developing that theory and then using that to explain to policymakers why it's so important. Yeah. So in a sense, we have to get our, our own house in order before we can then do that work of convincing uh, policymakers. I hope I've answered your questions. Thank you.